Welcome to another episode of Electable. I'm Deb Chubb, and we are very excited to continue with our series featuring Democratic women running for the Indiana State Legislature. And today we're very fortunate to be with Penny Gibbons, who is running for Indiana House District 62, which is down around Bloomington and Brown County. And, um, and I'll let you tell us a little bit more about your district. Um, um, but thank you for coming. And if you can, just give us a little bit of your background and then tell us why you're running. Sure, sure. Thanks, Deb. It's good to see you again. <laughs> um, so this district is southern part of Monroe County and it kind of wraps a little bit to the east of, of Bloomington. Also, it's all of Brown County and a little bit of Jackson County. Um, I am a Hoosier. I grew up in Richmond, Indiana. I have a I graduated from Purdue and then did graduate work at IU. So I feel like I have a split brain, you know, it's, it's hard to <laughs> reconcile those two things at times. Uh, not really. I, I'm very fortunate to be in a state that, that offers that to people. Yeah. Um, but I'm currently a county commissioner and there are things as a commissioner I just can't do. I can't work on pay equity. I can't work on paid family leave. I can't work on education and universal pre-K. Um, I can't work on the a lot of the environmental issues that I care about. And so that's those are some of the reasons I'm running for state legislature. Well, those are such important issues. Um, there, I, I don't even know how to pull them apart, you know, one at a time. There's just, they're so important. And interestingly, um, I, when I go around and talk to people about the, uh, the, the lack of women's representation in the state legislature, I say, just look at our policies and you, you will know that we are, that women are underrepresented in our state legislature. And you bring up many of those issues uh, that are not, are being ignored by the Republican supermajority. So, um, and we'll have to, of course, include in there, you know, women's rights to control their own body. Uh, now that we see that being stolen away from over half of our population, um, it's frightening. So, but let's start, you know, start with whichever issue you want to talk about first. But I think, um, I think it's important to talk about what you want to do um, in many of those areas. Well, you know, when we when we talk about a big, big issue like health, we have to understand that paid family leave plays into that. Um, and it's not just paid maternal or paternal leave when a new one, new little one is born, but it's also if you need time away from work to care for a spouse that has a broken leg, uh, an elderly parent that had a hip replacement, just all kinds of things go into that paid family leave that other states offer. Right. Um, and they, they have a system set up that's sort of um, like an insurance system that would take care of that. Well, and um, we know that that's an issue that really impacts women because women are the part of the family who is the one who, like we saw in the pandemic, who quits their jobs to take care of family. And right. so they are the ones who financially suffer the most from not having paid family leave. Right. And, and we're seeing this now across the state. Um, when I talk about universal pre-K for all four-year-olds, a, a report just came out. I just saw it today for the first time that Indiana is at the bottom in terms of the amount and quality of, of pre-K we offer within Indiana. We can do so much better. And when we do that, the kids that get good quality pre-K are much more likely to graduate from high school, earn better wages, less likely to interact with our court system. Um, just so many positive things that come out of that. Um, one estimate I saw said that every, for every dollar you pay for quality pre-K, you save $7. That's right. And so it makes fiscal sense to do this, not just, oh, this feels good. Um, it's it's the right thing to do on so, so many levels. And when we talk about women in the workforce, offering that universal pre-K then takes some of the stress off of other parts of the childcare system. So it becomes easier to find childcare. We've got, it's estimated at least a, a million workers in the United States that have not returned to work after COVID because they cannot find childcare or at least not find affordable childcare. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, you know, as you know, I've been in the early childhood education field for many years. And, and there are just 
a plethora of studies that you know show the economic benefit of providing high quality, affordable childcare and early childhood education. So that is something that is so important. And there's report after report, and there's really no excuse except that you don't really care about women. <laughs> that is uh, because that's who gets impacted. That's who stays poor. That's who stays unemployed and um, and frankly unhealthy from it. Right, it, it impacts mental health as well as physical health. Um, we need to start to acknowledge that. Um, when I said I grew up in Richmond, um, when I was growing up, there was a whole network of mental health, mental illness, whatever you want to call it, hospitals uh, all across the state. And in the intervening years, we have shut down hospital after hospital after hospital. And too many of those folks are now living out on the street. Yeah. And so I would like for us to get back as a state to providing better treatment for mental health issues and for substance use disorders. I don't want to go back to that sort of incarcerated system that we had before with our mental health uh, hospitals. We can be doing outpatient treatment. We've got new drugs that we can use. We've got new methodologies. And so I think that we could also support people and actually help people get back to work and keep families together. Um, if we if we can support some of these things, but you brought up what happened today um, in Indiana, Indianapolis, with um, a ban on abortion essentially, and this really it it's going to impact so many things. First of all, as women, I'm beyond the child bearing years. I don't think it's going to impact me personally, but um, this is about bodily autonomy and somebody else making decisions about what I do with my body or to my body. And as we've gone through the pandemic and I, I'm a county commissioner, I've had to worry about things with the pandemic. You know, we, we've seen people refuse to be vaccinated, for example. Nobody forced anyone to be vaccinated. Um, and if, I, if you want me to be a, a blood donor, you have to ask me to do that voluntarily. If you want me to, donate an organ, you have to ask for that voluntarily. If you want me upon my desk to donate, you know, an organ or my eyes or whatever, you have to have a pre-written certificate, pre-death certificate. So why are we saying that women don't have the same kind of rights as a corpse? That's and that's, right. what it, that's what it boils down to in, in some instances. And, and I'm a mom. I, I, I have done educational advocacy for special needs kids for over 25 years. I love kids. It's That's not the issue. It's whether or not I believe other people should have the right to decide if and when they become parents. Well, and you make a good point about the hypocrisy of um, the Republican supermajority who supported people having a choice about COVID vaccines, um, but now want to allow government overreach into women's lives uh, to the most, I don't know, to the nth degree, I can't even get my head around what kind of government control you have to admit this is over over half of our population. Uh, yeah. Now we're going to control women's bodies. The government will control bodies now. And, and some of the arguments that I hear just don't wash with me. I'm sorry to say, oh, well, that baby can be adopted. Well, 60% or more of the individuals who seek an abortion have one or more kids. So if you already have a child and you have to go through a forced pregnancy because that's what it's gonna be in Indiana, it's gonna be a forced pregnancy, who decides which child you give up? Okay, how do you decide which child to give up? Is it the oldest? Is it the baby? You tell me. There are just so many things that just don't it with this. Um, so I, I've been a longtime supporter of Planned Parenthood. I will continue to be a long time supporter of Planned Parenthood. I, as a young woman, went to Planned Parenthood for support uh, for my reproductive rights. Yeah, me too. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we, that's the other part of this bill is they essentially are going to uh, close down a lot of the Planned Parenthood that we have here in Indiana. Right. So we well, need to keep we're an counting eye on, on you. 
Yes, we're counting on you to get in there and fix this. Um, but let's talk about um, a few other issues. I mean, there's a lot of very important issues. Um, environmental issues in Indiana. Yes. Oh my yeah. gosh, we need so much help. Tell us about your plans. Well, you know, somebody said, how can we as a state impact anything? And we can impact our air quality, our water quality. We can reduce our demand on um, elect the electrical grid on the, you know, our power plants. Um, we have the worst streams and rivers in the country, according to one study. We have the highest number of coal ash ponds of any state in the, the country. And for people that aren't familiar with a coal ash pond, it's something that's created because of the ash that's left over from coal burning power plants. And those really should have both liners on them and caps on them so that it, they don't leach harmful chemicals into our water supply, into our aquifer. We don't want that. Um, we could be putting in commuter rail all around Indiana, especially around Indianapolis. People don't realize that there used to be an old commuter rail system around Indianapolis that went out to places like Greenfield and Mooresville. And maybe, I'm not sure if it went to Martinsville or not. I know it went north. But think about what that would do to cut down on pollution and the, the heavy use of our roads. Um, that could make a difference. We could be putting in uh, electric charging stations to encourage electric vehicles. We could put them in parks. We could put them uh, at the rest stations along our highways. Um, and then we could be, get back to full net metering for people with solar panels and to encourage the use of, of both homes and businesses to put more solar panels in to reduce, again, our, our demand on the the grid and the fossil fuels that are needed to create electricity. So I think we could do a number of things um, to make things better. That's excellent. Yeah, though, and those are very important and and certainly doable. If you know, if only the legislature had the will uh, to do it, uh, yes. we could definitely do it. So yes. that's something that I really look forward to seeing you and the legislature to manage those issues. Uh, you've been such a great uh, county commissioner. Uh, and very powerful in that uh, role and important and clearly out there to protect people and to you know help public health and other issues that uh, you can do only on this county level, unfortunately now, but hopefully soon in the state legislature. So, okay, great. So tell us, Penny, um, what can we do to help your campaign? How can we get you elected? How can we reach you? Okay, well, um, this is considered one of the, um, this is a targeted race, okay. okay? The Indiana House Democratic Caucus has targeted this as a tier one race. We can flip this seat. This is winnable. We've already been out knocking doors, making phone calls, at events, uh, at county fairs. We are working hard already to, to take this. Um, if people are willing to help, they can go to my website, which is Penny for Indiana. Pretty simple, just Penny for Indiana, spelled out. Um, we love donations, of course, because we know we're going to be doing a number of mailers and perhaps we'll be doing some digital ads and some other things. Um, but we also, if people live up where you live, Deb, and they, they want to make phone calls, we'll figure out a way to Great. have you phone bank with us. Um, so yeah, like I said, we're working hard. I've got uh, two young, wonderful staff, people who are working with me. I've got a high school intern, which is nice. just thrilling to me. Uh, she's, she's really good. So um, yeah, like I said, we're just, we're working hard and any support we can get, I would appreciate it. That's Even awesome. just spreading the word would help. Excellent. So great. And so I assume that you're on Facebook. Yes. And you're on Penny Twitter. For, Penny for Indiana. Penny for Indiana. <laughs> Penny okay. For Indiana. And they can, people can email me at pennyforindiana at gmail.com even. Um, excellent. Excellent. So yes, I know people have questions and um, and I'm, I'm so sure that people are so ready to uh, support a candidate like you who's really going to be helping women, helping kids, helping the environment. Uh, those are all such important uh, problems here in Indiana that we need a lot of help with. So, all right. Thank you so much, Penny, Thank for joining me. And um, and I know that we'll be catching up with you soon, um, probably at an upcoming rally in Indianapolis again. Really? 
So, um, so anyway, thank you again. And you're doing great. You are just such a terrific candidate. It's just been wonderful getting to know you and watching you do such a great job. So well, look forward you. to, yes. Oh, yes. So, all right. See you next time. Okay. Thanks, Deb.